1 Timothy 4, beginning in verse 6. If you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive, because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Command and teach these things. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Until I come, devote yourself to the public reading of the scripture, to exhortation, to teaching. Do not neglect the gift you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you. Practice these things. Immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by so doing you will save both yourself and your hearers. This is God's holy and errant and inspired word. And he writes its eternal truths on each of our hearts this morning. While uh, putting ourselves through uh, seminary, I uh, took a job in North Carolina as a waiter at Outback Steakhouse. And one Friday evening is the busiest time of uh, the week. Uh, Friday dinner rush, I was seated a, a party of 14, right smack dab in the very middle of the main dining area. Uh, at this restaurant. It was a combination of men and uh, women. So we're from a large Pentecostal church in Toronto, Canada, I found out very soon. Um, there on a, a, a pastor's conference. My mom grew up in Toronto. I actually knew of this church fairly well. My grandmother uh, used to like to attend it on Sunday evenings because she liked the music they played. So automatically I had an in with this uh, table and uh, got to know them throughout uh, the dinner service. <laughs> and uh, when bringing them their check, I'll never forget two things. First of all, they stiffed me on the tip, um, which sadly uh, a lot of Christians do. They have that reputation, unfortunately. Um, but secondly, something I will certainly never forget, uh, the lead pastor, uh, Pastor Susan asked if they could pray with me before they left. Now keep in mind, this is Friday night, 6.30 p.m., busiest time of the week. I don't know if you've ever had a Pentecostal person pray publicly or heard them. Um, I, I mean this with all due respect, it's, it's an event. <laughs> There were 14 of them, and every single one of them went around and thought they had to, in, in my mind at least, outdo uh, the last person that had prayed in fervor and enthusiasm for this young seminary student waiting tables. I remember being extremely embarrassed uh, and sharing that with a friend afterwards. He really kind of put me in my place by saying, well... I suppose that as a waiter, of all the questions that you could get asked on a Friday night, can I pray with you, probably isn't that bad, is it? And I thought, you know, you're probably right. This was not uh, something to be that upset about. It was not uh, a hill uh, to die on, necessarily. Um, but there are those hills, certainly. And I think that probably sums up uh, the gist of, of this second part of 1 Timothy 4. Paul is writing back to his young protege, Timothy, in Ephesus, and says to him, uh, no, there absolutely are hills to die on 
uh, when it comes to our understanding of God's Word and who God is, things that we cannot be compromising uh, on. And so uh, if, if you look down at verses 6, 7, and 8, uh, first of all, uh, uh, the, the exhortation here by Paul to Timothy is that uh, he would be receiving and be well trained. Notice it's a continual process, not just Timothy get the training and then go underground or then never uh, uh, train again. That uh, uh, verse uh, 6, if you put these things before the brothers, right, there's this introduction, you will be a good servant of Christ, being trained in the words of the faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Trained, uh, a progressive word that it would continue on. Um, the, the, the word Greek uh, in the Greek intensifies it, and trepho, um, uh, that you would be trained properly, that you would be well nourished, that you would be nourished with the right things. You know, you can sustain yourself, and I think I could do this quite easily by just building your diet on Ruffles potato chips. There is something, I think, personally about Ruffles, just enough salt, plain potato chips. I, 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 I honestly do think I could eat those day and night and sustain myself. <laughs> but as you, you realize, right, you're not going to be long in this world if you do that Timothy would receive a balanced uh, diet of right teaching, of uh, uh, correct words of the faith, that it would be continuous, that it would be constant, that it wouldn't just be something part-time that he does on Sunday mornings, that this would occupy his very life. And Paul does not speak this to Timothy just simply as the minister of the church. This is a call to all that claim Jesus as Lord and Savior, that we would continue to be trained up, that we would continue to receive a full diet of God's full word. This is why uh, you're not going to last very long. We, we, we've emphasized this before. By forsaking church attendance. You can talk the talk, but if, if the scriptures are true, you're not going to walk very far. You're not going to make it. You're going to get gobbled up by every wind of flimsy doctrine and, and teaching. The, the emphasis here is on that which is right. Notice the second half of verse 6 of the good doctrine that you have followed. Doctrine quite simply means teaching. That's all it is, is, is teaching that you would receive. Teaching about God. The doctrine of God can and must directly impact the way you live your everyday life. For a Christian, it's really not of any value to you, is it? It's not enough just to fill our heads with knowledge of God. It, it needs to directly impact how we think, how we speak, how we act, or it, it does us absolutely no good. Paul goes on to emphasize this point even more clearly. Verse 7, right? There's the Ruffles potato chips brand of doctrine. Have nothing to do with irreverent silly myths. You see, there's a contrast. You can't just simply say, well, you know, let's just praise Jesus the best way you know how. The fact of the matter is, you know how to do it. God doesn't leave that open to our decision making or to our opinions. He has laid it out for us in his word. We need to be careful to attend to that and be careful in how we speak it and how we teach it and how we understand it. He goes on then in verse 8 to talk about godly training. You know what godly training is? In the sports world, it's quite simply practice. That's all it is, is practice. We are to put this teaching into practice. We are to work at it. 
you've never played organized sports, one thing you will, will realize very, very quickly is that when game day comes, you're going to be able to tell really quickly uh, who practiced and who practiced hard and who didn't practice at all. Practices must be harder than the games themselves. Do you realize that? Practice is designed to be harder than the game itself. And you know why that is? Because if your practices are not actually harder than the games themselves, then the games will never get any easier. You see what I'm getting at? You see what Paul's getting at? If you train hard, the games will get easier. I'm not saying they will get easy. That's not what Paul's saying here. But easier. Paul is saying, train yourself. Train your life for godliness. Remember last week where Paul addressed the false teachers of his day who were saying things that like you grow in godliness by these external manifestations or by uh, sort of uh, implementing into your daily routines ungodly fasts and, and prohibitions to certain foods. But here now Paul gives the, 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 the rebuke, the rebuttal. He gives us here the corrective to that wrong teaching. Here is what he says. Train yourself for godliness. That the Christian woman who is struggling with a, a husband who is mean to her, unkind, that she would discipline herself for the purpose of godliness in prayer, Constant prayer and study of the word and meditation upon God's word. And, and, and attending these means of grace that God has given us. And when she has prepared that beautiful dinner for her husband coming home at night, and he's mean to her again, it'll be a little bit easier for her when he's unkind to her. It'll be a little bit easier for her to respond in a Christian way to him. You see, it's easier because she's been disciplining herself for the purpose of godliness. That that Christian man who's struggling with looking at internet pornography, that he's been carefully training himself in what he reads and what he looks at on the internet and, and when he does that. That he's careful in which company he keeps and how he speaks and how he understands himself and holds himself and allows others to hold him accountable. It's not that it's easy for him to do that. But it becomes easier for him the next time he's at the airport, the next time he's away on business and uh, alone in his hotel room to turn away from that lust, that sin which brings pain to his Lord and Savior. It becomes a little bit easier because he has been attending the means of grace, because he's been attending the worship of the living God, because he's been reading his Bible, because he's been praying for God to give him strength. You get the point. We are called to discipline ourselves so that when the temptations and when the challenges and when the difficulties of life come, and they will, that it makes it just a little bit easier to resist, to shine a little bit brighter for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the second point, the, the, a godly hope. Look down in verse 9, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God, who is the Savior of all people, especially those who believe. 
Do you ever meet temptation in your life or come upon struggles or maybe difficult people in the church and ask yourself, why am I doing this? I think we all do it. Why am I doing this? What is the source that keeps us from giving up and giving in? You see how the Bible answers that there in verse 10? Because of where we have our hope set. Therefore, we will persevere. Therefore, we will continue on. Therefore, we will not give up. Christian, if your hope is set upon the living God, the Savior of all people, especially those who believe you, then you will persevere. And I want to say that this is really a classic example of how theology, how good doctrine, good teaching is so important to the practical Christian life. When you feel hopeless, when this minister feels hopeless, where do you turn? Ultimately, you turn to the theology that God has given to us in his word. This is yet another reason why Paul uh, says to Timothy in verses 6 through 8 that you need to be nourished in sound doctrine. Because when the pressures and the trials of life come, God says the great encouragement that he gives comes from the promises that he makes to us. Promises that we see summarized and, and made clearly known to us in the theology of his word. You see, oftentimes I, I, I do this in my own life, and, and, and I'm sure you do as well. Oftentimes we... Pray in difficult circumstances. Lord, would you take these circumstances away? Would you change the circumstances that you can so easily change these circumstances? That I could be productive and living and, and sustained by hope. But if we're only concerned, if our only hope is in our circumstances changing, I will promise you this, that God is always going to answer those prayers to be known. Because living hope, the type of hope that he talks about here in verse 10, is a hope that is firmly anchored in God himself. And God is never going to give you something that is going to pry your hope away from him. That's where it needs to truly be. He goes on, I know we're short on time today. He goes on with this curious phrase that I, I feel like we need to spend a little bit of time on, that, that Jesus is uh, the savior of all people, especially those who believe. Some of you may see this and think, well, maybe my Arminian friends are right. Maybe God does give choice to us. Or maybe God's a universalist and he saves all people. There's your proof text right there. Well, if that were the case, for one, that flies in the face of the vast majority of, of other scripture. And when I say the vast majority, I mean there's so many other passages in scripture that we can turn to that says that's not what this passage means. And I'll just cut to the chase and say I think this means three things to us here. Well, maybe just take two of them. First of all, what Paul is trying to say here and encourage Timothy with is, is the fact that there is no other Savior in all the world for men than Jesus Christ. I hope you hear this week in and week out at this church. This is a goal of mine. I don't know that I always uh, uh, meet it. But we're believers of the, the free offer of the gospel. 
But like as you're sowing seed and casting it out on, onto your lawn or onto your field, we, we, we send the gospel out, we proclaim it to all that would hear it. That the, that the gospel is offered to everybody. Not all receive it, not all take of it. But the fact remains that there is no other salvation to be had in life except for that which comes by faith in Jesus Christ. There is no one else who can save. That's, I think, what Paul is, is getting at here. And then the second thing he's saying when he uses this phrase is to remind the original audience here that God is not only the Savior of Jews, but he's the Savior of Gentiles. Gentiles from every tribe and tongue, and people from every nation. Most uh, Christians at this time in the church, in Timothy's small church, it was probably no more than 70 or 75 uh, members, didn't have copies of the New Testament. They had Old Testament uh, uh, access, certainly it was more readily access. It was still being written at this time. But they had the Old Testament, and they would have rightly understood that the God of Israel was the same one and the same God as the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That the God of Israel was the triune God that they worshipped as Christians. But there were some, I think, who believed that the God of Israel was, well, the God of Israel. And there was another God for the Gentiles. There's some schools of thought out there today that would come dangerously close to this uh, teaching as well. And so in some of his original audience's mind, there was perhaps one way of salvation for Israel and another set way of salvation for the rest of the world. And here is what Paul is saying to them. He's saying, no, the God that you proclaim, Timothy, is not only the Savior of the Jews, but also the Savior of Gentiles and of every nation. And remember, too, that Timothy was facing a teaching that said there were only a select few that understood that God is not the savior of some bizarre sect that can only do this. He's the savior of all men, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, male and female, civilized and barbaric. He is the one true God. Thirdly and finally in this passage, we see the importance and the need for gifted and godly pastors. I think there must have been many times, Timothy, you'll notice here, Paul, um, says in verse 12, let no one despise you for your youth. You must have been fairly young. Difficult, uh, challenging church, it would appear. Uh, Paul's encouraging this young man not to give up. And he encourages him, I think, in, in six ways. I won't go through all six. I'll just mention uh, those. But the first is that Timothy, as pastor of this church, would speak with authority and instruct his flock with these things, these truths. Verse 11, notice how he puts it, command and teach. The word Paul chooses here, command, is a military term. If a soldier is given an order by a commanding officer, they are uh, obligated to do it. Why? Because of the authority that their commanding officer has over them. Paul instructs Timothy to preach with authority, not his own authority, not even Paul's apostolic authority 
But the authority that the Bible is the word of God because of the authority that God has. This is how Timothy is to preach. Now, I've been told by some, by modern experts especially, there's no shortage of them today, uh, that this is unpopular for churchgoers today. That they don't like being preached at. And that I need to loosen up a little bit. Be more therapeutic, perhaps. Some modern, one modern expert has advised ministers to just give advice and don't be so declarative. And so on every side as a pastor, I'm being told that what we do here at at Good Shepherd is absolutely wrong. That we need to change, that change is needed. can't stand to be told what to do. Here's the thing about that. As far as I can tell, historically, people have never liked being told what to do. But there has There's never been a time where people like to have somebody discover learned uh, uh, things about them, found those things to be lacking. When you're thinking here, that you need to go in another direction. You see, brothers and sisters, if we are honest with ourselves, we, we love our sin. And our sin has done strange things, warped our hearts. The word of God is authoritative. And therefore, the preached word of God needs to come with authority. Because God's word is the only thing powerful enough to transform our lives. Remember we said that at the beginning of this sermon, that that if these truths, these central truths, don't directly impact your life, transform you and change you, then it's really of little value to you. In other words, our hearts really are that rebellious, that hardened, that stubborn. We need God's authoritative word and God's word preached into our lives week in and week out in order to bring the transformation that God is looking for, that we truly need. Paul then gives Timothy five things to prove his office by his life. You see that there? Let no one despise you for your youth, but set for believers an example in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity. to guard our speech as ministers, our conduct. When he calls ministers of the gospel and leaders in the church to love people, it's, it's a call to love them at your own expense, to put their interests above your own. Be an example in faith to let people see you trusting in God's promises. And of course, purity here, he's talking about sexual purity. So, all you ministers out there this morning, elders here today, are you striving to adorn your life with this godliness? That's what Paul is calling us to do. We have a a special burden to strive after this holiness, by the grace of the Holy Spirit. One last thing to note, because um, we could probably take verse 14 and and spend several sermons on it. Do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy when the council of elders laid their hands on you, and Timothy was ordained to this office. 
There are some out there that think, well, you know, just as long as uh, someone has good personality, that's, that's more than half the battle. You don't need ordained people. You don't need them telling you what to do, but the Bible would differ with you there. And how do we do that? Verse 15, practice these things, immerse yourself in them, so that all may see your progress. Christian life is a very difficult life. It's never easy from what I can tell. There are blessings along the way, and oh yes, they are incredible blessings. But there are many, many struggles along the way. You need to be prepared for them. I want to sort of end on this. If, if this gift, verse 14, that has come to Timothy, that has been confirmed by the Apostle Paul, that has been given and delivered and uh, uh, planted and started the training of it in Timothy by the Holy Spirit himself, if that gift, Paul still needs to warn Timothy to not neglect, then what does that tell you and I about our daily progress, about our daily disciplines, about our attending to the Word of God, that, that, that we would attend with due diligence, with open eyes, do not neglect, these ordinary means of grace that God has given to you that can only be savored and feasted upon in the church of God. You need those. You need to attend to those. And so that's a call both to the leaders of churches and to members of churches as well. Do not neglect these gifts that God has given to you. The Word of God, especially the preached Word, prayer and the sacraments, you need them to lead a godly and disciplined life. Brothers and sisters, do not neglect them. Continue to give yourselves to them. Discipline yourself. Maybe this means uh, starting to read uh, a chapter of the Bible every day before you turn your phone on, before you uh, start scrolling through everything else. And mine sits right next to my bed. It, it, it can happen very easily. To savor the grace, to savor the goodness of God, He has given us so much. Look no further than the cross of Jesus Christ to see that, to know that, to experience that in your own life. That God stopped at nothing when he gave Jesus to us. And so we need to see that, we need to know that. But we also need to pay attention and let that motivate us in our daily disciplines, our daily pursuits. Just one last thing, notice what he says. Verse 8, it holds promise for the present life. Yes, it does. But also for the life to come. It's this grace that God gives to call us to himself, to convert us, to transform us. It's the same grace that he uses to persevere, so that we would persevere to the very end. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Trust in him. Savor the grace that he gives to you that only he can give to you. And let it transform your life. Let's pray together. Father, guide us and direct us now. Help us to be more like your son, Jesus. We thank you for him, for the good gifts that he has given us, and help us with all uh, diligence to continue to train for godliness, and the promises that it makes to uh, this life and especially the one to come. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name.
Amen. Our closing hymn is hymn number 